During the one hour special, Hyundai Assembly 7, I opened a box from ECM Tuning that had an ECM Link version 3 1G ECU in it. That ECU gives me a variety of choices about how to deal with airflow metering. Along with that order, I picked up a speed density cable, a General Motors style Omni 4 bar map sensor, and a GM intake air temperature sensor. In Hyundai Assembly 9, in preparation for this video, I chose to buy this part from STM Tuned. It's an extreme turbo system speed density throttle body elbow. This let me solve the intake air temperature sensor installation and restricted factory throttle body elbow with a simple, inexpensive, well-made bolt-on part. Adding a GM intake air temperature sensor onto your DSM can't get any easier than this. Also in that video, I fabricated a bracket to bolt down my Omni map sensor in the way that I think will work best for my setup. Some people get creative with this part from milling out a spot to make it bolt down onto the plenum with a grommet like it does on most GM cars, or dangling it loose from the hose and its electrical connector with no preparation at all. I made this funky bracket and I plumbed mine to the PCV breather port on the intake manifold with a short section of quarter inch hose, clamped on both ends of course. This is just what I did. I encourage you all to be creative. That's where we've been for all the newcomers. Where we continue today is by installing this high quality speed density cable that's terminated on both ends with weather pack connectors. You simply plug in the harness into the intake air temperature sensor, and then you route your other connector through and plug it into the map sensor. And the other end of the cable plugs right into the mass airflow sensor connector on your factory harness. I've moved my mass airflow connector in closer to my firewall on my car. A DSM's MAF sensor includes both the air intake temperature sensor signal and the barometric signal connections. ECM Link version 3 is a product for first and second generation DSM's and Evo 1, 2, and 3's. This isn't any of those, but it might as well be. Still, this is not a DSM and you won't find your ECU in this location. Inside this factory Hyundai Elantra case is a 1G turbo ECU. Everything I need in order to tune every aspect of this engine swap fits into this factory Elantra case and plugs into the factory harness. You can't get a simpler, cleaner example of a DSM engine management system than this from anyone else. The possibilities are as limited as your 5 volt inputs and still then people have proven that the rules can be bent. This setup will be the foundation of all of my car's fuel tuning solutions. It's the proving grounds. I'm new to version 3, but I've been using an older version 2 for more than a decade and hopefully sharing my experience with getting this started up helps other people out. Fortunately for me, there are wiki pages to help me with the setup and I use them. The wiki pages are forward facing, but registered users who bought ECM Link have a membership to a dynamite community of talented users, developers, and engineers in the product forums who have been hacking DSM ECUs for over 18 years. Owning the real thing grants you access to all of that, and you can't beat that level of support. Not after this many years. I like to do things myself, and using a search button there always yields great results, so please enjoy watching me follow directions. To all of you who have this product already, I'm sorry I'm late, is all I can say. If you're late like me and you're interested in a setup like this for your DSM, then links to the ECM tuning website are in the description to help you get started. Previously, this car used a pocket logger setup for engine monitoring. This is a pocket logger cable pinned into the factory diagnostic port. The other end of the pocket logger cable is plugged into a Palm Pilot through a serial adapter and was... Some of you still don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, a Palm Pilot was like your dad's iPad. It had a 150 by 150 pixel display that was neither black and white nor color. It was so old that it displayed in pencil. They were 90s technology. Despite their frustrating caveats like battery dependent memory retention, slow sampling rates, and short battery life, they were actually a decent solution for monitoring your car's ECU in 1990. But the pocket logger solution could only read the ECU, and not very much of it. It only offered one-way communication. I think it's cool that someone managed to make a Palm Pilot useful for something other than an address book or a place to feed your virtual monkey, but it's 2015 and I'm making room for a modern solution. This is the ECM Link version 3 cable for a 1G DSM. You get this OBD1 diagnostic connector on one end, and there's an inline serial converter with a USB connection on the other end. This thing plugs right into your OBD1 diagnostic port. This is not where you'll find it on your car. It just so happens to be that this Hyundai interior control unit has the diagnostic connector on the bottom molded into the fuse panel. But on a DSM, it's a free floating connector. I'm going to put my interior back together rather than routing the ECM link cable through it because when I'm not using the cable, I'll just unplug it. 
Once we've got this straightened out, we just need to install and configure the software and start it up. Minimum system requirements are Windows 2000 or better, or Mac OS 10.4 or better, with no less than 256 megs of RAM. There's a Linux build available for you Raspberry Pi guys, and you can even use a Windows Pro tablet as well, but Android and iOS are not viable options. Today we're going to be using a late 2013 Retina MacBook Pro with a quad-core i7 running macOS 10 Yosemite 1101 and 512 gigs of PCIe SSD storage. This one has 16 gigabytes of RAM and the gig and a half Iris Pro graphics chipset. So I should be okay with the minimum system requirements, you think? This thing's so new it only has two charge cycles on it. But anyway, ECM tuning uses a change log and that's self-explanatory. If there's any changes, it's in the log. The installer is exhaustively and publicly documented. The Windows installer is large, so incremental installers often come in the form of patch updates. Start with the full install and upgrade to whatever you need. It appears that they recompile a Mac version on every release. You can see the date changed. It doesn't say full install, but don't worry Mac people, it is. If you're a Linux guy, then like the Windows guy, you'll need to watch out for full install versus updates. The other dependency is supporting a serial interface cable that lets you connect your 23-year-old ECU to a brand new computer with a simple USB cable. There are different installers depending on which operating system you're running, so I'm going to go ahead and pick that up. Next I'm going to pick up the newest available version of ECM Link. Once the download is complete, go for the serial driver first. On the Mac you launch the disk image, and if you look at the directory there are three drivers. You don't need to install them all, not unless you're stuck using an operating system that's more than 10 years old. The only one you need is FTDI USB Serial Driver underscore Snow Leopard Package and Package Package. Lion, Mountain Lion, Mavericks, and Yosemite users need not fret. It works on all of those, and I know this to be fact. If you launch the installer and you're greeted with this window, then your failure to install the software means failure to recognize what that window is. That's Gatekeeper and it's a macOS security feature on latest OS's. Right click the installer and select open and you'll get around Gatekeeper. So here's the installer window. Continue. Thank goodness that that wasn't a license agreement or I've had to have read it. Click the install button and authenticate it. In real life speed this took me 35 seconds. Now if you're installing this application for the first time, Apple no longer bundles Java with their operating system. They offloaded that responsibility to Oracle where it belongs, but you shouldn't need to experiment with any of their versions of it. If you don't already have Java on your machine, getting it is easy. Launch the installer and click More Info. It will take you to a page that installs Apple's old version of Java 6. Click Download and wait for 64 gigabytes to happen. If you have some crazy version of Java that conflicts with ECM Link on your Mac, then Google how to uninstall it, search for the software listed right above that download button, and get this version because it works. I'm showing you this on a Mac, but it doesn't matter what you have. The principles are exactly the same. ECM Link is a very consistent product on all the platforms, and no version of ECM Link is any needier or whinier than the others. You don't need to right click to install Java 6 because your Mac knows where it came from. Click continue, 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 agree, install, authenticate, wait, close. With Java in place, now we can run the ECM Link installer. You need to right click to bypass Gatekeeper and now we're in business. The installer walks you through finding a place to put the application and the default location works best. You want it in your applications folder. The next screen gives you the option to create a desktop shortcut and an option to clear preferences. There's really nothing to erase, so it doesn't matter. This is the install in real-time success. I don't want to run ECM Link yet, though, so I'm unchecking this. We're not actually done installing the serial driver for the cable. The serial driver installer doesn't invoke a reboot. The serial driver is a kernel extension, and kernel extensions only load at startup. So it's the only piece of the software that requires it in order to work. So we're going to restart this thing, and that's great, because in real life that takes 9 seconds. It's even less than Jaffro time. Launching for the first time, click next. Important, read carefully. Signature license agreement, EULA is legal agreement between you and either an individual or a single team. You agree to the terms of by installing, copying, or otherwise using the product. If you do not agree, do not install, do not use the product. You will not be held liable for any damages claimed by you based on any third party claims such as a complaint, 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 the main application window opens up to 22 buttons, a field with a path to the logs directory, and a status window telling us that we're not connected to anything. And we're not. The first thing you need to do is tell the software what hardware it needs to look for. So click the button on the left that says Configure Connection. In the first field labeled Device Type, choose your ECU version and platform. 
I've got a 1G version 3 ECU. Older versions are listed below, and the V3 software works with those as well. The next field is initial port, and that's a serial connection being used to connect to the ECM Link ECU. We installed the serial driver for the ECM Link USB cable, and there it is. There are checkboxes which give you connection behavior options and port negotiation settings, but we're already done here. The serial connection is configured to use the ECM Link version 3 cable. It should connect. Want to see? Okay, let's do this. The moment it connects, the bottom right pane displays information about your ECU, and the device status window shows the software reading all of the ECU settings to display in the software. You can edit your ECU's live data, and this is the first thing that you see. Idle, two-stage rev limiter, and throttle position control. It's unfair to only call it a two-stage when there's technically a third stage, but that feature is optional. We're not going to start there. Go all the way to the last tab, which is ECU inputs. I have to point my aftermarket sensors at which input they're connected to on the ECU in order for it to know what to do with them. The bottom two menus tell the ECU what kind of map sensor you have and where to look for it, and the top window tells the ECM Link software where to look for the sensors and what kind of sensors they are. If you don't set this up, you won't get any information in the logs about your sensors that's valuable to you. If the bottom settings are correct, the car will run just fine if you don't. But if you want to know what all your aftermarket sensors are doing, then you need to set the correct pins in the top. I have five inputs to choose from. Because I'm using the ECM Link speed density cable, the barometric input is used for the Omni 4 bar map sensor. The intake temperature input is used for the GM intake air temperature sensor. This is all I technically need to set up because much of the other settings are flashed as defaults in my case. You'll be able to set them up as you make changes to your car's configuration. My advice is to be as thorough and accurate as you can here. Once all of your sensors are assigned to the correct input pins, remember to save your pin assignments. You have to hit the save button if you want any of your changes here to stick. Once you save your pin assignments, you get a pop-up window reminding you to visit the captured values menu so you can add the new sensors to the logs. In this menu, the left side contains the values that you're able to monitor. The right side has the ones that you're currently monitoring. You must add the values you wish to log into the right column. And if you saved your pin assignments, then you'll see your sensors by name in this menu. There's my Omni, and there's my GM intake air temperature sensor. You can get here from the view menu or by clicking the captured values button on the ECU input screen. The DTCs, or Diagnostic Trouble Codes tab, lets you read and evaluate and clear codes from your car's error checking routines. You can also use the bottom checkboxes to turn off certain routines that may not apply to your car's configuration. If you click up to the Miscellaneous tab, you'll see a bag of tricks under Options that I recommend everyone read the wiki pages for technical details about how and when to use them. Down below you get a series of solenoid triggers and buttons to turn your injectors on and off individually. These are great when you have one hole that's not acting right, it helps you figure out which one. Turn each one off and back on until the behavior doesn't change and then there's your problem hole. The solenoids are a joke on my car because I have neither of them. If you use those circuits for something else, this is another way you'd test it. Under devices and diagnostics, you get check boxes to ground the diagnostic connectors or the ignition timing connector without having to actually physically do it. And a check box to activate your fuel pump. You saw me prime the oil system in the last video, now it's time to prime the fuel system and check for leaks. Oh yeah, the healthy click of my 30 amp fuel pump relay. That's a good sign. I'm confident in my plumbing, but now it's time to find out if that's really just confidence or arrogance. Nope, nothing leaking up front. Let's check the fuel tank connections. Nope, nothing leaking back there either. Nothing up top. Now let's set the fuel pressure. I don't have to pull the vacuum line off because the car isn't running and pulling any vacuum. I'm just turning the center Allen screw to set my fuel pressure check it dead on. I want mine set at 43 PSI. That's where these injectors work great on another car with the same turbo. And then while holding it in place with the Allen wrench, lock that setting down with a lock nut. It should be a pretty obvious rule that whenever you've messed with your fuel system that you should pressure test it prior to adding fire to the mix. And we're ready for fire, but I want to shift gears for a minute because I don't want anyone to feel excluded. Except the Linux guys. Just kidding, Linux guys. I've got love for them too. I'm going to restart this thing, so bear with me for a second. My camera has trouble focusing on this shiny black screen. But is it the camera having trouble, or is it magic? Ooh, ah, magic. Suddenly we're booting into Windows. Windows 7 to be specific. Yeah, I know Windows 8 is faster, and ECM Link runs just fine on either one. 
Supporting a product means you fix whatever the customer hands you. And I'm here to tell you that ECM Tuning does this very well. They aren't platform snobs. They love everybody and so does Jaffro. Jaffro doesn't have a choice. Jaffro works in the techosphere. So we're here at the download page. Same thing. Go for the serial driver first. In order to install the serial driver, you have to have escalated administrative privileges on the machine. Unpack the installer, run the installer, and once the Windows driver finishes the install, unlike the Mac version, it asks you to restart the machine. Go ahead and do it. It'll make your life easier in a minute. I wish this was Windows 8 because it would reboot in 5 seconds instead of 15 seconds. Come on! So here we are back at the login. You don't have to have elevated privileges to install the ECM Link software, but I'm logging in as the machine administrator anyway. First stop is the downloads page, and I'm going to install the latest version just like on the Mac side. We start with the full installer first. Wait for 20 megabytes, which takes no time here in Jaffer's garage. Unpack and install the ECM Link software. All this looks familiar, doesn't it? It's because it's pretty much the same installer and it runs in Java as well. From behind the keyboard, only the paths have changed. The application's the same. There's one extra checkbox for a quick launch icon, and why not? Actually, I want to uncheck the Run ECM Link option because I don't want to launch it yet. Now that we have the full ECM Link application installed, I want to pick up the update for the latest version. Really, this is Rinse Repeat. It's a smaller package, so you do the same thing. It just takes less time. You don't need to tick a single checkbox or change a thing unless you installed the original application into a different directory. Now here we are in the ECM Link software. I know what this says, and I'm bound to it. It sounded scary and dangerous the first time, and that only means it's going to be lots of fun. So here we go with the same thing. Configure the connection for a 1G version 3 ECU and set up the initial port. COM3 looks like what my system wants, and it's my only option, so click OK. And now connect. Go into the live ECU data. You'll see that it takes you to the same tab as on the Mac. The only difference is the tabs on the side are all conveniently visible at once because that's how the Windows version of Java displays it. Go straight for your ECU inputs to configure your software to talk to the right hardware on the proper pins and you're golden. I'm going to go into more depth on the first time configuration settings, but I'm going to switch back to the Mac side because I can't zoom properly on this Retina display in Windows 7, and you'll be able to see what I'm doing a whole lot better. At least I have the Windows version if I ever need it. I'm going to turn the fuel pump on, reboot it, and cut the fuel pump back off on the Mac side. No. Come on, Microsoft, really? How many people can say they killed their car battery because of Windows updates? I rebooted this thing five times trying to prevent this. In the middle of a video shoot, and this is what you gotta pull, really. Anyway, it's not the software that's whiny, it's always the users. I'll spare you the 20 minutes that I had no choice but to suffer through here, and we'll move on. But there, now we're back on the Mac. Turning on and off the fuel pump just demonstrates that the computer is talking to the ECU. And next we're gonna dig a little deeper into the ECU configuration and fuel settings. You have to admit that whether you're testing your fuel system, a misfire, loss of compression, setting your timing, testing sensors and solenoids, that these are pretty awesome conveniences to have buttons and checkboxes for. This is one lucky Elantra. Now that fuel pressure is dialed into 43 PSI, which is unusual for a 1G, I need to add that fuel pressure variable into my fuel settings to ensure that I can calculate the correct global fuel settings. There's a vacuum of information out there about these PL4750RC injectors, so I had to figure them out for myself. I provided 43% and 305 microsecond dead time from the donor car's data. I found that those settings were the safest and the most forgiving with both the logs and my butt dyno. So let's see how I managed to do up against the built-in global fuel trim calculator. First I put in the 43 PSI for my fuel pressure. Then I set the injector size. And because I'm burning pump gas, we've got a 14.7 to 1 stoichiometric air fuel ratio. If you click calculate, you'll see it in the calculator before you click use, but it's going to use the values you enter here anyway. So let's see what I've got. 44.1% global, 305 dead time. I was only off by 1% with my butt tune on a different car. But now I'll just save those settings to the ECU. DSM Link version 2 didn't have this cool calculator in it. In the math compensation tab, I've got base math type set to speed density, and that was also flashed as default by request. Make sure you have this set this way if you're converting it from a different airflow metering setup. The timing curve is flat, as well as the math correction. Math clamp and the speed density table are at their default values. 
This table was preloaded as a base setup to help me get started with my airflow adjustments and fuel tuning. Eventually we'll be simulating the narrowband oxygen sensor signal with my Innovate LC2 wideband, so we'll be back to this tab eventually. There are anti-lag controls for help with spooling huge turbos, knock sensor controls to help eliminate phantom knock, conditional fuel pressure solenoid trigger, same goes for the EGR solenoid, gear-based boost control, which I know I'll be getting into eventually, and you even get the ability to reassign the factory boost gauge that I don't have to do something else. You can change your coolant temperature offset, and you can even set when and why the check engine light comes on to warn you about your little right foot problem. It's as if there's nothing that this package can't do. This is just intended to be my 10 cent tour of how easy it was to install ECM Link and to configure my 92 Hyundai Elantra for speed density airflow metering. Really, I just followed directions that were on the ECM tuning website. Call me biased, but I'm of the opinion that for well over a decade, this product has consistently been the single most useful and effective upgrade you can install in your first or second generation DSM, Galant VR4, or early production Evo. If you have one of those cars and for some silly reason you don't have this diagnostic, tuning, launching, anti-lagging, logging, and feature-laden programming tool yet, then there are links to their website to help you learn how to get started. It doesn't matter what stage of a build your car is at or even if it's completely stock. I also included links to the setup instructions I followed. You've seen how it's configured, now it's time to start this thing. In the next video. You know that one deserves its own video. Come back to see those sights and sounds in its very own video. Third time's always a charm, you know this. Click the link. <laughs>